Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Today is another in the core concepts video series. Now, as a reminder, this is a back to the basic series in which we really are just trying to understand what is happening inside of the body so that we can better assess and care for clients with acute and chronic conditions. So this is a great series if you're a fundamental student, but this is also a really nice series if you're in a med search course and you just need some refreshers on the basics. So again, welcome back to the Core Concepts video series. Today we are going to be discussing sensory perception. So sensory perception is the ability to perceive and interpret sensory input, and that sensory input is going to come from one of our five senses. And then we're supposed to be able to take that sensory input and translate it into one or more meaningful responses. So again, when we think about sensory input, it is going to either come through our vision, our hearing, our smell, our taste, or our touch. And then the interrelated concept is mobility, and you're going to see why in just a few minutes. And we have already covered mobility as a core concept on this channel. So if you missed that video or you want to go back and review it now that you've heard about sensory perception, I will have it linked in the description box below. Okay, so sensory perception, um, the most common cause of alterations in taste and smell are going to be dry mouth. And we see that very commonly in older adults. Now that is often a side effect of a medication. So think antidepressants, antihistamines, uh, chemotherapy agents, anti-epileptic medications. We often see that dry mouth as a result of those medications and that does alter our taste and our smell. And the easiest way to fix that is just to discontinue the agent that's causing the problem. Now that might be easier said than done if the client needs the medication, but there are other strategies for dry mouth such as um, increasing moisture in the mouth with water, hard candies, just cleansing out the mouth with a, a wet washcloth. So if we can discontinue the causative agent, that will solve, resolve the problem. Otherwise, we need other strategies to help with the dry mouth. Now, touch, which is also called peripheral sensation loss, this is most commonly caused by an acute or chronic neurologic condition. So think about stroke, a traumatic brain injury, spinal cord injury. Now, unfortunately, especially with traumatic brain injury and spinal cord injury, those sensory deficits are typically permanent and there's not a lot that we can do about them. Now, vision and hearing, those are the most commonly affected sensory perception deficits. And many adults have impairments but are able to function independently, oftentimes with the use of some sort of corrective aid. Okay, so as we think about risk factors for sensory perception, the rest of this discussion really is going to focus on vision and hearing. Those are our most common sensory deficits, and they're the ones that, I hate to use the word easily, but that we can more easily correct and accommodate for. So the rest of this discussion is going to focus on vision and hearing. So risk factors for vision loss, aging in general, is going to result in some degree of visual acuity loss. So we see older adults with presbyopia, which is farsightedness. So having to use those reader glasses, glaucoma, cataracts, and then unfortunately macular degeneration. Now diabetes mellitus and hypertension, remember are chronic conditions and over time they do damage to our neurological system. Thus we can see vision and hearing loss particularly vision as a result of diabetes and hypertension. Now you can also have direct mechanical or chemical trauma to the eyes. Of course, cranial nerve two is our optic nerve. If it becomes damaged, there is some genetic risk and then medications such as antihistamines and antihypertensives can also negatively affect our vision. Hearing loss, so risk factors, again, aging. Presbycusis is sensor neural hearing loss, often associated with aging. We also can have occupational factors like loud noises. Maybe if you're constantly exposed to loud noises through your job, cranial nerve eight is the hearing nerve. So if that nerve becomes damaged, there's also genetic risk. And then we have several ototoxic medications. So ototoxic, meaning they damage our hearing. One of the most common assessments for ototoxicity is tinnitus or ringing in the ear. And those medications that put us most at risk for hearing loss are salicylates, diuretics, anti-epileptic medications, and aminoglycoside antibiotics. Now the physiologic consequences of vision and hearing loss. So first and foremost, and what should be forefront in your mind as a nurse is injury. And so in particular, we think about falls. So the risk for physical injury is high if your vision is impaired or if your hearing is impaired. 
We might also have clients that are not able to perform activities of daily living, that have difficulty with ambulation because they can't see, or they have difficulty with verbal communication because of a hearing loss or written communication because of a vision loss. When we assess these clients, we of course want to take a good health history for both the client and the family. Vision and hearing loss can have a genetic component, so we do want to take a good family history. We want to inquire about the use of eyeglasses, contacts, and magnifiers, so those reading glasses for vision, and then the use of hearing aids or amplifiers for hearing loss. Now, if you have a client that's using a, a corrective device, you do want to ask about the effectiveness of that device. So do you feel like your vision is better when you wear your glasses? Do you feel like when you use your magnifiers or your reading glasses that you're able to see better? Are your hearing aids working? Or do you feel like when you, even when you have your hearing aids in, you're not able to hear very well? Now for visual acuity screening, we often use the Snelling chart, but we can also use the Rosenbaum chart, although the Snelling is most common. And then for hearing acuity, we often use the Whisper test, but then we also might use the Weber or the Rhine test. And the Weber and Ryan test help us distinguish between a conductive hearing loss or a sensorial neural hearing loss. Now, if you're very unfamiliar or just need a refresher on Snelling, Rosenbaum, Wine, Reber, Weber, and Whisper test, wow, that was a tongue twister, um, I do am offering a free study guide on those one, two, three, four, five different uh, vision and hearing acuity screening tests. So all you need to do is shoot me an email and I'll be happy to send you that free study guide. It does have pictures as well as instructions on how to perform the test, how to interpret the test, and then a video as well if you're that visual learner and you really would like to watch those tests being performed. Okay, as far as health promotion, we again need to think about primary prevention and secondary prevention. So primary prevention, remember, is taking risk factors that are already present and really minimizing the chance that those risk factors are gonna turn into a problem. So we wanna avoid risk factors as much as possible. So that might be avoiding loud noises, making sure that we're wearing protective devices, so safety goggles, earplugs, um, things like that to avoid damage to our vision and hearing. Other primary prevention strategies would be healthy lifestyle, so preventing diabetes mellitus and hypertension. So a lot of that we can do through diet, um, but then also exercise, all of those healthy lifestyle behaviors that are modifiable. Secondary prevention is where we are going to screen and test in order to detect early problems so that we can get them treated or corrected as soon as possible. So again, think about the tests that we just discussed and then also regular eye exams. So I believe the recommendation is every three years for adults under the age of 50, I think actually might be 45, but then annual eye exams starting sometime in the mid 40s. And that is because we know vision does decline as we age and that regular eye exam will get those problems corrected sooner. Because again, remember the real problem with vision and hearing deficits is a safety risk. Now, when we think about interventions, of course, medication therapy might be indicated, particularly for glaucoma. Uh, corrective lenses, we've talked about, hearing aids we've talked about, maybe surgery to remove cataracts if that's the problem. If for clients that are completely blind or legally blind, they might use a guide dog or braille. Also closed caption programming for hearing loss, assistive listening devices, and then sign language for those with hearing impairments. Okay, guys, that's all I have today on sensory perception and the impairment of sensory perception. Um, hopefully you found this video helpful. Again, if you would like that free study guide on the vision and hearing acuity screening tests, please be sure to reach out via email. You can also find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest. I am posting daily on Twitter and Instagram. So if you're interested in any of that content, you can check that out over there. And if you would like to catch up on the core concepts video series I will have the entire series linked in the description box below I believe this is the 14th or 15th in the series and we are nearing the end have a wonderful day and I will see you in the next video